Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the University of Southern California's Friends of the USC Library's 16th Annual Scripture Awards. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president of the Friends of the USC Libraries, Regina Leimbach. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening in the Los Angeles Times reference room where we are surrounded by the most glorious architecture and many, many books. It is my great pleasure to now introduce our Scripture Event Committee Chair, Catherine Goldsmith. <laughs> Catherine is a Senior Vice President for Public Relations and Government Affairs at CIRA Technologies. She began her involvement in the USC libraries in 1985 and has been a supporter of the Scripture event since its inception. Catherine, I would like to thank you so very much and ask you to thank the event, the event committee for all your loyal work, fun work, and so that we can have this beautiful evening tonight. And now may I present Catherine Goldsmith. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you, Regina, and may I add my welcome to all of you. I recently read a manuscript by William Morris. 
and it was entitled Some Thoughts on the Ornamental. He was, among his many other endeavors, a book printer. And let me read just a little bit of it to you. If I were asked to say what is once the most important production of art and the thing most to be longed for, I should answer a beautiful house. And if I were further asked to name the production next in importance and the thing next to be longed for, I should answer a beautiful book. To enjoy good houses and good books with self-respect and decent comfort seems to me to be the pleasurable end towards which all societies of human beings ought now to struggle. Now, when you hear this manuscript quoted, it usually ends there, but I was delighted to be able to read where it progressed, because he then compares the treatment of books to the often rude treatment of one's friends, and he said, just so I have seen a man hold his dearly beloved book friend, the mislaying of which would destroy his night's rest, and bend back the boards till the back cracked again, dog ear its leaves, turn its face downward on a dirty table, blot it with ink and smear the blot off with his thumb, in short, so maul it that he deserved to have his books read to him henceforth instead of being allowed to read them himself. <laughs> now, if he were alive today, I'm sure that William Morris would have added film to his important works of art. And he would be equally enraged with people who abused or pirated those works of art. So extending his thoughts, I muse that his ultimate would then be to watch a beautiful film from a beautiful book in a beautiful house. So how fortunate are we this evening to be in this beautiful building, honoring not one, but two beautiful films made from two beautiful books. And I'd like to thank the sponsors of this event. You saw their names on a placard out in the hallway, and you can see them in your program. Without them, this event would not be nearly as glorious as it is. So we thank you, one and all. And let me also thank the Scripture Event Committee and the Information Services staff. They uh, have done an exemplary job, as I'm sure you can appreciate, and will continue to appreciate throughout the night. So let me have them stand and be recognized. Come on. Come on. Up. <laughs> Thank you. It has been a delight to be their chair. We have had spirited and wonderful meetings. Um, now it gives me another great pleasure to introduce our Master of Ceremonies for the evening, Sharon Gless. Yes, yes. I'm not done. <laughs> Sharon Gless entered our homes and our hearts when she starred in Cagney and Lacey as Christine Cagney, a role that garnered her six Emmy nominations, two Emmy Awards, and her first Golden Globe. Even back then, she was no stranger to Doheny Library because one episode of the show was filmed right here. She since has starred in many television series and made for television movies, including The Trials of Rosie O'Neill, for which she earned two more Emmy nominations and her second Golden Globe. She currently is filming her fourth season on Queer as Folk. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ms. Sharon Glass. Thank you, Catherine. Um, it's a great honor for me to be here tonight, and I'm a little nervous. As my family will testify, the world of academia escaped me. <laughs> I do come from a long line of USC Trojans and family. My grandfather, my father, my brother, my sister-in-law, and my niece, and my husband, Barney, all graduated from USC. I was sent to a Jesuit university out of which I was thrown. <laughs> but I did learn not to end my sentences in a preposition. <laughs> it's tragic, really. So I joined, <laughs> so I went into show business. <laughs> anyway, so thank you so much for your very warm welcome. Now, the Scripter Award is an extraordinary event, drawing together leaders in publishing, 
business, education, and film to celebrate the work of writers. In fact, it's the only award in the world that honors both the author and the screenwriter for the best book to film adaptation. A friend of mine once said, where would we actors be if it weren't for good writers? And how true it is. John Ritter spoke those words as the MC of this event last year. And he was looking forward to serving as your MC again this year. We were all stunned and saddened by his untimely death, and he is greatly missed by all of us who worked with him, who knew him, and who loved him. Finely crafted writing is what he lived by. He believed in the power of the word. I first met John in 1985 when we were working together on a movie called Letting Go, and we remain friends throughout our careers. It is a great, great honor for me to follow in John's footsteps as the MC of this wonderful event. With us tonight are John's wife, Amy Yazbek, and John's daughter, Carly Ritter, who recently extended John's USC legacy by becoming a second-generation Trojan. It says I, but I know we all want to thank both of you for joining us here tonight. I want to tell a John Ritter story. I don't know if Amy knows this one. Um, <laughs> as I said, I did a movie with John, and uh, it was a real family affair. I believe he produced it, his best friend directed it, and his mom was there every single day on the set, and I got a chance to get to know her. And I was telling her, because I had not worked with John before, what a wonderful man he was and how much I was enjoying my experience with him. She said, John has always been special. And she said, let me tell you a story about when he was five years old, I guess in kindergarten. And she said, Tex and I, John's parents, uh, raised the boys on a ranch in San Fernando Valley. And John's favorite animal on the ranch was the rooster. He loved this rooster, she said. He loved that it would wake him up every morning, and he loved chasing it because it would run when he chased it, and it was his friend. And one day, the rooster had to be put down by Tex, and Mrs. Ritter's job was to tell young John when he came home from school that his friend wasn't here anymore. And she explained to him what had happened, that he'd gone to rooster heaven. And John looked up at her, and he said, but Mama, who will bring the dawn? That's our John. So John, thank you for bringing the dawn to us every day for so many years. We miss you. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce USC's Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, Lloyd Armstrong. Thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, those of you who are regular attendees at this event knows that, know that uh, normally at this point, you would be getting a welcome to this event and to USC uh, from our Chief Information Officer and Dean of the University Libraries, Jerry Campbell. Uh, unfortunately, our friend Jerry uh, is in a hospital at the moment, uh, waiting surgery next week, and so he's missed his own biggest party of the year. So in his stead, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to USC and to the 16th Annual Scripter Awards. This is one of the university's most eagerly anticipated and highly regarded events. We're delighted that you have joined us in this historic library to celebrate writers and the written word. 
We do have several members of the USC Board of Trustees with us this evening, and one of the pleasurable parts of my job is to introduce uh, uh, them to you. I would ask that they stand up when I, I call their names and remain standing so that we can recognize them as a group. They're Ann Hill, Ken Leventhal, Harley Norris, Virginia Ramo, Lorna Reed, Barbara Rosier, and Glenn Sonnenberg. Ladies and gentlemen, our trustees. We also have with us tonight several USC administrators, and I ask that they also stand when I call their names and remain standing so that we can recognize them as a group. Robert Cudietta, the Dean of the USC Thornton School of Music, Marilyn Flynn, the Dean of the USC School of Social Work, Madeline Puzo, Dean of the USC School of Theater, Michael Jackson, Vice President for Student Affairs, Carolyn Webb de Macias, Vice President for External Affairs, and Martha Harris, Senior Vice President for University Relations. Ladies and gentlemen, our administrators. And there is good news. Once again, Hal Cantor returns as the Grand Master of Ceremonies for the Scripture. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge the people that we will be participating in tonight's presentations. Leonard Malton, Elaine Kagan, Ann Archer, John Singleton, Richard Reeves, Elizabeth Banks, Gary Stevens, Kelly Curry, and Paul Antanasio. And it gives me great special pleasure to congratulate this year's Scripter Award winners, Arthur, author Dennis Lehane and screenwriter Brian Helgeland for Mystic River. and author Laura Hillenbrand and screenwriter Gary Ross for Seabiscuit. And finally, I would like to acknowledge Warner Brothers and Universal Studios for their support of this event. Now, as most of you know, Tonight, for the first time in the Scripter Awards 16-year history, we honor the writers of two winning books and films. I don't know. First, there was a tie for the National Football Championship. <laughs> now for the Scripter, where will it end? But both of our winning films tonight have received Oscar nominations for Best Picture, both of our winning screenwriters have received Oscar nominations for Best Adaptation, and both of our winning books have been national bestsellers. Is it any wonder that we have a tie? Although Mystic River and Seabiscuit, an American legend, present marked contrast in tone and subject matter, they explore similar dramatic themes. In both stories, characters who are riddled with conflict find themselves living lives that have fallen short of childhood hopes and dreams. In their attempts to push back against oppressive circumstances thrust upon them, characters make momentous decisions that affect friends and family in profound and life-changing ways. Ultimately, what draws us to these films is the very human desire of each character to control his or her fate. Through their artistry, the artists behind these films allow us to experience struggle and redemption and invite us to face our own challenges and pursue our own dreams. Tonight, we gather in the Edward L. Doheny Jr. Memorial Library, an institution whose very mission is to help students, faculty members, and patrons take active role in shaping their intellects and their lives a great research library 
such as this one remains unrivaled in its ability to provide the knowledge and information resources that individuals need. One of those individuals is a Scripter winner tonight, Laura Hillenbrand. In her book, Sea Biscuit, an American Legend, Hillenbrand thanks one of our librarians, Daisy Taub, for working late to shift through our archives in search of the photos that grace her book. By, by, <laughs> by joining us tonight, you play a part in preserving Doheny Library and ensuring that generations to come will never be at a loss for words or for the perfect image. And now it's my pleasure to welcome back our Master of Ceremonies. Sharon. Pardon me, I have a cough drop in my mouth. Okay, wait. Excuse me. <laughs> Real life. <laughs> Thank you, Lloyd. <laughs> I am delighted now to introduce the man who has used his razor-sharp wit to help celebrate 15 previous Scripter Awards. Hal Cantor has served as the Scripter Award Master of Ceremonies until four years ago when he officially graduated to Grand Master of Ceremonies. Hal has always been a Grand Master of Comedy. He's written for such comics as Bob Hope and Jack Benny. He also is part of the team that wrote the 75th Annual Academy Awards and recently was nominated for the Writers Guild Award for Best Comedy or Variety Show. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please join me in welcoming a Scripter Award legend, Mr. Hal Cantor. On this uh, Valentine's Day weekend, I want to say good evening, language lovers. <laughs> to quote that passionate public speaker, George W. Bush, <laughs> who loves language to death, <laughs> I want to thank everybody who made this evening necessary. especially our glamorous mistress of ceremonies, Sharon Gless, the past tense of glass, who brings added gloss to this evening. I offer my personal gratitude for reminding me that it's my turn to say something. As my old buddy Barney Rosenzweig, a reformed press agent, who is also a USC alumnus, whispered to his wife earlier, this is the 16th time I've had the privilege of addressing this gala evening. And at my age, a gala evening is about as much as I can handle. <laughs> More, actually. I've reached the time of my life when staying home is the time of my life. But I relish coming out for the friends of the libraries, even though if I have to use what we used to call a walking stick, although I've never seen one walk, I'm still recovering from an accident, my birth. <laughs> so now you know what I am. It's always uplifting, uplifting to be here among so many tastefully dressed, sober citizens, which some of you appear to be. <laughs> it will surely be a comfort to Dr. Campbell when Tony Miller reports how many of you friends chose to be here instead of accepting Arnold Schwarzenegger's invitation to join him in New York for his $500,000 a plate funder. 
fundraising. Did you read about that? You must have. Imagine, a half a million bucks for one meal. What do you tip a waiter? Twenty percent or a thousand shares of AT&T. See what a bargain your dinner is tonight? What's happening to America? $500,000 for one Republican meal. And the Democrats have to struggle to raise enough money to send at least two millionaires up against Bush and Halliburton. At the moment, it looks like the Democrats' standard bearer will be the tall senator from Massachusetts who has been called Lincoln-esque so often. John Kerry put on a top hat Last month, went to the Super Bowl game and freed the New England Patriots ba backfield. <laughs> uh, politics aside, long after that game's halftime demonstration of tastelessness, the fallout continues over the fallout of a trivial entertainer's uncovered silicone. Yet nobody seems to have objected to the parade of golden globes in their double-breasted evening gowns on their awards last month. Lord knows what the Oscars will bring us this year. Wouldn't it be great if the Academy voters agreed with the USC Friends of the Libraries and voted a tie for the best screenplay adaptation? It could happen. Our Scripter Selection Committee has a great record of selecting winners. We celebrate authors here. That's the purpose of these annual events. The Friends of the Libraries recognize that writers and writing are indispensable to man's knowledge of himself and the world he pollutes. <laughs> We're here to encourage excellence in the symbiotic relationship of book and film and not, incidentally, the box office for both. As a frequently unemployed screenwriter, I am privileged to be a part of these festivities that honors the best in film adaptation of a book, a coveted award which I myself have once again failed to win. <laughs> That's something my colleagues Helglin and Ross can't say because Brian's here for the second time as a winner and while Gary's here for the first time as a winner, he was here once before as a busboy. <laughs> or so I've heard from some unreliable force, sources. Tonight, my job, no, wait a minute. Uh, my job is uh, getting ahead of me here. Five years ago, Brian shared his first scripter with Curtis Hansen for their stunning adaptation of James Or Elroy's L.A. Confidential. But this year, he doesn't share that screenplay credit with anybody, so we congratulate Brian and the Writers Guild Credits Committee for Mystic River. A brilliant job. It's a brilliant job, Brian, which will keep Clint Eastwood on this side of the camera for many more years. My enormously talented friend, Gary Ross, not only wrote that ingenious screenplay of Laura Hillenbrand's book, she also directed the film, he also directed the film, with such wit and vigor, his Seabiscuit is doing as much for Santa Anita as San Francisco is doing for wedding rings. <laughs> I must admit a special fondness for the Ross family. Gary's father, Arthur, another fine writer, once gave my kids a little Airedale puppy that my wife named Flea Biscuit. <laughs> Tonight, my job was to whip you into a frenzy of indifference. <laughs> and now that I've accomplished that, I will leave you with a sweet story, sweet short story, of children in a Catholic school who lined up in the cafeteria for lunch. 
At one end of a long table was a pile of shiny red apples to which a nun had applied a sign reading, take only one, God is watching. At the other end of the table was a pile of cookies where a child had stuck another note, and that one read, take all you want, God is watching the apples. <laughs> So now, <laughs> let's eat and take all the coffee you want because tonight God is watching the wine. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back our Master of Ceremonies, Sharon Glass. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed your dinner. Before we honor our Scripture Award winners, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, we would like to acknowledge and thank the individuals on the selection committee whose literary sense and good taste ensure that wonderful writers are nominated and selected each year for the Scripter Award. Many of the selection committee's dozens of members are with us tonight. They include screenwriters, authors, scholars, and entertainment industry leaders. What galvanizes the selection committee is the participation of a strong selection committee chair, and the Scripter Award certainly has that in Oscar winner Robert Town. Unfortunately, Robert sends his regrets <laughs> that he cannot be with us tonight as he is in South Africa in pre-production for his next film. Now, with the selection committee members here tonight, please stand and be recognized. Thank you. The competition for this year's Scripture Award was especially keen. Now let's roll the clip and review the 31 eligible films and also highlights from the five finalists. That's so funny.
Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce one of the country's most recognized and respected film critics and historians. He is also a member of the Scripter Award Selection Committee this year and a proud USC faculty member. And I give his new books every year to all my friends for Christmas. <laughs> So this is a real treat for me. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in welcoming Leonard Malton. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, my mother thanks you, my father thanks you, my publisher thanks you, and I thank you. Uh, uh, I also want to say I'm starting my sixth year teaching here, and it's the, one of the greatest experiences of my life, and I'm very proud to be part of uh, this university and the cinema department. I also want to congratulate Tony Miller and all the people on the Scripter staff for, uh, uh, no, because you, 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 you may have read about this in the paper, they were able to with, withstand an attempt at a hostile takeover from the Golden Globes earlier this year, so <laughs> it's a real achievement. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, introduce uh, our first uh, major film clip from Mystic River, which of course is one of the most celebrated movies of the past year. It's been nominated for numerous awards, including the Oscar, the Golden Globe, Writers Guild, Screen Actors Guild, British Academy of Film and Television Arts. The story explores the interwoven history of three men, the terrible events that tainted their boyhood and shaped their futures, and the irrevocable choices they ultimately make. It's an emotional story about family, loss, revenge, and commitment. In the scene we're about to watch, Sean Devine and his partner question Jimmy Marcus and his wife about the events leading up to his daughter's murder. Please join me in taking a look at Mystic River. Mr. Markham, you say you spend most of the day Saturday with your daughter in the store, is that correct? Yes, and no. I was mostly in the back. Anything odd? Uh, confrontation with a customer? Anything? No, she was herself. She was happy. She what? What's the matter? Listen, the littlest thing could be something right now. Just when she was little. Right after her mother died, I'd just gotten out of prison. <clears throat> she couldn't be by herself. You know, whether she was crying or not, it didn't matter, but she... She'd give you a look sometimes, like she was prepared to never see you again. A couple of seconds on Saturday, she, she looked at me that way. Okay, it was just a look. It's information. You collect it, put it together, see what fits. Little things. You say you were in prison? Yes. Here we go. Buddy. I'm just asking. Sixteen years ago, I did a two-year bid for robbery at Deer Island. Is that going to help you find my daughter's killer? I mean, I'm just asking. Let, let's forget about that. Let's, let's come back. Thank you, Leonard, for the introduction. It is now my great pleasure to introduce the presenter of this evening's first author award, Elaine Kagan. Elaine Kagan is an acclaimed author of five published novels and a member of the Scripter Award Selection Committee. She is also a talented actress with whom I've had the pleasure of working and has appeared in such films as Goodfellas, Coming to America, and Traffic. In 2002, she was the honoree at a USC literary luncheon. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Elaine Kagan. Thank you, Sharon. In the clip we're about to watch, Jimmy Markham is trying to come to grips with a parent's worst nightmare, the death of a child. We watch as he struggles to tell his childhood friend, Dave Boyle, about the pain that her absence inflicts. When I got out of the joint, you know, after Marita died, I remember I was more afraid of my little daughter and I ever was of being in prison. I loved her. Most. 
when we were sitting in that kitchen that night. It's like we were the last two people on Earth. You know, forgotten. Unwanted. They could have came cry for her. My own little daughter, and I can't even cry for her. Jimmy. You're crying now. Damn, damn. I just want to hug him and look at him. It is my great pleasure to acknowledge Dennis Lehan. As tonight's first recipient of the Author Scripter Award, he extends a long tradition in excellence in fiction. Novelists who have previously won this award are Ann Tyler, Stephen King, Jane Austen, Michael Andachi, James Elroy, Michael Chabon, and Michael Cunningham. Mystic River was a finalist for the Winship Penn Award. It won the Anthony Award and the Barry Award for Best Novel and the Massachusetts Book Award for Fiction. On behalf of the Friends of the USC Library, I am proud to present the 16th Annual Scripter Award to Dennis Lehane. The actors Adam Nelson and Kevin Chapman, who played the formidable brothers Nick and Val Savage in the film, will accept on behalf of Dennis, their friend, for his haunting novel, Mystic River. Shaking the three of us. <laughs> <laughs> Sean Penn, who does it too. It's the first time I've been nervous accepting an award for someone else. <laughs> you know, as film actors, we work in a medium that requires a considerable amount of money for me to do something that I truly love to do. But before that happens, someone needs to write something on a piece of paper that inspires someone to write that check. So, writers everywhere, I just want to ask you, please, to continue to inspire so that I can continue to do what I truly love. Thank you. I just want to say that uh, <clears throat> I became a Dennis Lee Hain fan in 94 in his first book I read a review of when I was uh, back east, drink before the war. Uh, and then several years after that, about five or six years ago, he's doing a book signing on Cape Cod, and I decided I wanted to meet this guy. Went and met him and had a nice chat with him. Found him to be a very lovely man and very intelligent. And then I got a chance to uh, be involved in Mystic River and I got a chance to know him over the past couple of years. And I actually talked to him a couple hours on the phone and asked him if he had anything he wanted me to say. And the only thing that he said was, after getting quiet for a second, how deeply appreciative he was of receiving this award tonight. And uh, I want to thank the scripters awards people for having the guts to choose a, a film like Mystic River. I think it's very deserving. And Dennis is very appreciative. Thank you. Thank you, Adam and Kevin, and congratulations again to Dennis Lehane. It is now my great pleasure to introduce the presenter of this evening's first Screenwriter Award, Ann Archer. Ann Archer is an Oscar-nominated actress with whom I have also had the pleasure of working and has starred in such films as Fatal Attraction, Patriot Games, Shortcuts, and Clear and Present Danger. She, presently, she recently excuse me, played Mrs. Robinson at the Gilgood Theater in London's West End and, and The Graduate, sorry, Ann, and is currently co-starring with Tommy Lee Jones in the Revolution Studios film Cheer Up. She is a member of the Scripter Award Selection Committee and a proud, proud parent of a current Trojan, Jeff, who is a freshman here at USC. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please join me in welcoming Ann Archer. Thank you. 
Thank you, Sharon. Well, in our final clip from Mystic River, we see Annabeth Markham restore Jimmy Markham's confidence in a scene worthy of Lady Macbeth. I want to feel your heart. Last night, when I put the pearls to bed, I told them how big your heart was. I told them how much you loved Katie, because you created her. And sometimes, your love for her was so big, it felt like your heart was going to explode from loving her. I told them their daddy loved them that much, too. That he had four hearts, and they were all filled up and aching with a love that meant that we would never have to worry, and that their daddy would do whatever he had to for those he loved. And that is never wrong. That can never be wrong, no matter what their daddy had to do. And those girls fell asleep at peace. It is now my great pleasure to recognize Brian Helgeland. He is a previous scripter, as been mentioned, previous scripter, Academy Award and Writers Guild Award winner for L.A. Confidential, an adaption based on James Elroy's novel, which he co-wrote with Curtis Hansen. He belongs to an impressive group of previous scripter winners, including Frank Darabont, Fanny Flagg, Akiva Goldsman, Lawrence Kasdan, Steve Clovis, Anthony Minghella, Emma Thompson, Stephen Zalian, and David Hare. He has written and directed three films, The Order, A Knight's Tale, and Payback, and he recently adapted A.J. Quinnell's novel, Man on Fire. The film version stars Denzel Washington and will be released in April. Brian's screenplay of Mystic River has been nominated for an Academy Award, a Golden Globe, the Writers Guild Award, and BAFTA, that's the British Academy Award, for best adaption. Regrettably, Brian cannot be with us tonight because he is attending the BAFTA Awards in London. On behalf of the Friends of the USC Library, I am delighted to present the 16th Annual Scripter Award for the Adaption of Mystic River to Brian's friend and dear beloved friend and longtime attorney, Alan Wertheimer, who will accept on Brian's behalf. I'm honored and flattered to have been asked by Brian Helgeland to accept the script award on his behalf. He's asked me to apologize to you for his absence and to read you a few remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, my apologies for not being able to attend this year's event. As a scripter alumnus, I remember quite fondly my night there with Curtis Hansen and James Elroy. It is a fine evening. Unfortunately, I'm in London where I've been asked to represent Mystic River at a different ceremony. This is an unfortunate result of all of this year's awards being pushed closer together, and one I sadly regret. My congratulations on this night go to Laura Hillenbrand and Gary Ross for their well-deserved recognition with Seabiscuit. I applaud you both. The truth is, Mystic River could have been made without me, but it could not have been made without the efforts of two men whom I greatly admire, Dennis Lehane and Clint Eastwood. Dennis Lehane is, quite simply, the author of Mystic River. The story sparked to life in his mind and was born from his heart. A really good writer, in my opinion, is someone who not only is brave enough to tell the truth, but is also wise enough to figure out what the truth is in the first place. Dennis Lehane, by that definition, is one of the most honest men I have ever met. It's been my pleasure to simply be true to his story. Clint Eastwood, on the other hand, is my filmmaking hero. He conducts himself with a grace and simplicity that I envy as much as I hope to one day emulate. Not to mention his fearlessness. Consider that this man, who had nothing to prove, went out and proved himself when he could very easily have played it safe and lost nothing. 
He's been at this medium for 40 years, and he still found some new facet of his work to explore. Still found a way to strengthen and deepen his vision as an artist. I cherish my time with him. Good night, and I thank you all very much. Thank you, Alan, and congratulations again to Brian Helgeland. I'm delighted now to introduce a selection committee member and USC alumnus who is one of the best young directors around. Now, regrettably, I have not worked with John, but I figured this is my chance to suck up. <laughs> he won three writing awards from the university before making his directorial debut in 1991 with Boys in the Hood, which garnered him Academy Award nominations for Best Original Screenplay and Best Director. He has since directed Poetic Justice, Higher Learning, Rosewood, Shaft, Baby Boy, and Too Fast, Too Furious. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming John Singleton. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, it's an honor to be here this evening uh, at this uh, event. I, I was a screenwriting major here at USC in the School of Cinema Television, uh, and I received a Bachelor of Fine Arts in uh, Filmic Writing, so I had heard about this event while I was in school, and it's amazing now that I'm here at the event, now I'm on the selecting committee. I'm honored to be able to introduce uh, what I think is uh, one of the most American films, American of, of films, Seabiscuit, Sea Biscuit, directed, written and directed by my friend, Mr. Gary Ross. Seabiscuit this year has raced to the awards, um, finished with garnering a Director's Guild nomination, Producer's Guild nomination, Golden Globe nomination, Screenwriting Guild nominations. The film tells the story, the true story, of a down and out racehorse who beat the odds and inspired the imagination of a nation during the Depression. The horse's fate is intertwined with that of a trio of very different men, the owner, the jockey, the trainer, who overcome personal obstacles to emerge as runners. In the scene that we're about to watch, those men, the jockey, Red Pillard, and it has his fate thrust upon him with his, with his family reeling from the devastation of the Depression. Red's parents reveal a decision that will haunt the young jockey for life for years to come. Please join me in, in taking a look at Sea Biscuit. Three feet. What's wrong? What's wrong? Everything. Dickens, Wordsworth, there's your Arabian Nights and Moby Dick. Even your melon from when you were. Why? What's wrong? Mr. Blodgett here, he, he has a house, a real house. And his wife cooks. She is a good cook. And, and, no. no, there's even a phone next door. Shh, we'll call shh. you. Every couple of weeks, we'll call you and we'll no. tell you where we no. are. We just gotta go home, all right? Go. No, listen to me. You have a gift. You have a gift. We'll be back. Well, go with him. He's going to take care of us. Okay, go It is now my great pleasure to introduce the presenter of this evening's second author award. Richard Reeves is a writer and syndicated a columnist who has made a number, excuse me, 
I need to back up again. Sorry, I'm trying to adjust to two things. Richard, forgive me. Let me start again. <laughs> Richard Reeves is a writer and syndicated columnist who has made a number of award-winning documentary films and is a visiting scholar with the USC Annenberg School for Communication this year. The recipient of the 1998 Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Society of Newspaper, Newspaper Columnists, Reeves has written extensively for numerous magazines and is a former chief political correspondent for the New York Times. Several of his highly praised books, including President Kennedy, Profile of Power, have been bestsellers. And if that weren't enough, he has a cameo in Seabiscuit also. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Richard Reeves. Thank you, Sharon. I get to say more now than I, I got to say in the film. Uh, Seabiscuit is an American story, and it's about uh, hope and courage and redemption. Uh, it is about America. The subtitle of the book was uh, An American Legend. And America is not a land of opportunity, as it's shown in the book, in the film. The greatest freedom in America is the freedom to fail and to try again to change jobs, to change your name, to come to California, uh, to start again. Uh, in the clip that we're about to watch, Seabiscuit's trainer, Tom Smith, a failure, uh, reveals to Seabiscuit's owner, Charles Howard, who has failed, why their jockey, Red Pollard, the young man we just saw, uh, has just lost the Santa Anita handicap uh, by a nose. I told you, look out for Rosemont. I thought I had it. You stopped riding. I couldn't see him. What the hell are you talking about? He was flying up your tail. Yeah, well, I can't. What? See out there. He lied to us. What? He lied to us. You want a jockey who lies to us? What do you mean? He can't see. He's blind in one eye. It's fine, Tom. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. You don't throw a whole life away just because it's banged up a little bit. Good night. Writing is a, is a lonely thing, no matter what you uh, write about. Uh, Joseph Conrad, who we can all learn from, uh, his wife locked him in a cabin out beside their house every morning and locked the door and wouldn't let him out until he had written, slipped five pages under the door. <laughs> then she would let him come out and drink. <laughs> I don't know much about uh, screenwriting, though I do know about uh, one of the nominated movies tonight. I share a literary agent with Charles Frazier, who wrote Cold Mountain. And he, as I think most writers probably should do, sold outright uh, the rights to, to Cold Mountain, uh, but then read in the paper that it was going to be filmed in Romania, called 
our joint agent, Amanda Urban at ICM, and said, this is an outrage. I want the film back. They can't do this. North Carolina and the mountains are a character and an important character in this film. Uh, Ms. Urban didn't know exactly what to do, so she decided she works in New York to go to her trainer, who is a very, the au courant uh, trainer in New York named Maradu or something close to that, who is a Romanian. And as she got there pulling a the thing, and she's worried about this is a big client, we don't want to lose. Uh, what does Romania look like? And Radu said, have you ever been in the western part of North Carolina? <laughs> there you go. Uh, it takes a great deal of hope and a great deal of courage to do these things alone without the world knowing uh, that you're doing it. And for Laura Hildenbrand, it took a great deal more courage uh, than it takes for most of us, for most writers. Uh, the author of Seabiscuit, an American legend, uh, extends the tradition of excellence in nonfiction. Those of us who are nonfiction writers take this very seriously. And she follows in the path of Oliver Sacks, of Jonathan Haar, of Sylvia Nasser as winners of the Scripter Award. Uh, she has been writing about history and thoroughbred racing for 16 years. Was a contributing editor for Equus Magazine since 1989. Twice she's won the Eclipse Award, which is the highest journalistic award in thoroughbred racing. This is her first book, uh, Seabiscuit, and a, an astounding book, really, about three men and a horse uh, in America uh, rise, rising above failure. It raced to number one on the New York Times bestseller list. My wife told me that I read it in long before Gary uh, talked to me about it, uh, that I read the book in a single sitting. Uh, I didn't remember it that way, but then it turned out that yes, I had stayed up all night. Gary Ross was way ahead of me because he had expressed interest in getting uh, Laura's book to film it uh, when it, before it was written, when it was a magazine article in American Heritage Magazine, where luckily for Gary and for Laura, uh, Richard Snow, the editor, likes the ponies. Uh, <clears throat> the, Laura was also the consultant on the PBS uh, documentary on American experience about Seabiscuit's life. Now, as many of you know, uh, Laura Hildenbrand, a young and beautiful woman who suffered from severe chronic uh, fatigue syndrome for, for nearly half of her life and was unable even to travel from Washington uh, here tonight to accept that award. So in her stead, uh, Elizabeth Banks, who plays Howard's uh, wife uh, in the film, and Gary Stevens, who made his acting debut, uh, and a hell of a one it was, uh, in the role of the legendary jockey, George Iceman Wolf. My line was, Iceman, you did it. How does it feel? Uh, Gary is here uh, to accept uh, for Laura, uh, along with Elizabeth, who's one of the most promising young actresses uh, in our country now, has appeared in a number of feature films, including Catch Me If You Can and Spider-Man. Gary. Stevens, not Ross, uh, is one of the greatest jockeys of all time. He won more than 4,700 4, races, eight Triple Crown races, won three Kentucky Derbies, two Preakness Stakes, and three Belmont Stakes. He was inducted into the Racing Hall of Fame in 1997. On behalf of the Friends of USC Libraries, I'm delighted to present the 16th Annual Scripting Award for Laura Hildebrand, Seabiscuit, an American legend. Thank you, Richard. Same as Hollywood, this isn't scripted. I wasn't supposed to go first, but uh, Elizabeth said you go first, so I will. 
First, I want to tell uh, Mr. Hal Canther, thank you for your compliment uh, tonight of saying that I'm the best actor that you've ever seen. Uh, obviously, you've lost a lot of money on me at uh, Santa Anita. Uh, you are a horse player. Uh, <laughs> they've given me only one minute to give a short antidote uh, about what this film has done for thoroughbred horse racing. And what Laura Hildebrand has done with the book Seabiscuit, I can relate uh, with Richard's story. I was on a red-eye flight uh, going to ride a million-dollar race in New York City, and normally I sleep uh, from the time I leave LAX uh, for about five and a half hours until I land at JFK. I go into the weigh-in room, I sleep for another three and a half hours, get a massage, get up, ride my race, I'm back on a plane. And I start reading that book at midnight, and I close the book up at 4.30 a.m., and I'd read about half of it. And it had taken me about uh, four and a half months to read half a book all of my life. <laughs> and uh, I won the million dollar race, got back on a plane at 6, a, or 6 p.m. I was back at LAX at uh, 10 p.m. that night. I'd finished the book and it changed my life. And uh, as they say in uh, horse racing terminology, the rest is turf. Uh, turf history. <laughs> I know I speak for both myself and Gary when I say that it was a thrill and a true honor to participate in the making of the movie Seabiscuit and we both congratulate Laura and Gary Ross, our marvelous director, on their achievement tonight. Laura really regrets that she couldn't be here. She's the loveliest person, and I am thrilled to be reading her remarks to all of you. The calls started coming in the morning after I had sold film rights to my book. Everyone, it seemed, wanted to warn me about movie people, and each caller had a splashy horror story to tell. By noon, my joy had become trepidation. With my head full of spectacularly catastrophic cautionary tales about authors who had sold film rights to their books, I wondered what I and Seabiscuit's story were in for. Had I known Gary Ross as I do now, I would never have worried. Working with Gary as he crafted my sprawling manuscript into a magnificent screenplay turned out to be one of the most joyful experiences in my writerly life. My concern that the truth about our subjects might be lost in the translation from page to screen was quieted by Gary's devotion to capturing the people, the horses, and the era just as they were. My questions about how such a complicated story could be told in a movie's limited framework were answered by Gary's wondrous ability to shape the story to his medium. My fantasies about capturing the thrill of racing on film were exceeded by Gary's bountiful imagination. Watching Gary at work was a dazzling spectacle in itself. Those who predicted that my experience with movie people would land me in therapy were very wrong. <laughs> Gary's screenplay is everything I had dreamt of and so much more, and I am deeply grateful to him for his bounding ingenuity, his compassion for our subjects, his respect for history, his trust, and his friendship. To be honored in the company of so many brilliant writers alongside the supremely talented Gary Ross, is a thrill comparable to few in my life. My deepest thanks go to USC, Gary Ross, and the men and women who brought us the wonderful, incomparable Sea Biscuit. Thank you, and I thank you. Thank you, Richard, Elizabeth, and Gary, and congratulations to Laura. It is now my great pleasure to introduce the presenters of this evening's second Screenwriter Award. Callie Curie is a screenwriter and director who won the Oscar for Best Original Screenplay in 1991 for Thelma and Louise. She wrote the script for the 1995 film Something to Talk About. More recently, she made her directorial debut with her adaptation of The Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood. Paul Antanasio is also a screenwriter. He has garnered two Oscar nominations for Best Adapted Screenplay for Quiz Show and Donnie Brasco. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Callie Curie and Paul Antanasio. That's, that's the latest and most original pronunciation of my last name I've heard in a long time. It's, it's, it's Corey. Callie Curry. It's Corey. Sharon. Callie Corey. Yeah. yeah, they did say that. It was the they writer's fault. <laughs> Who wrote that? It was the writer's fault. It always is. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, in our final clip, we watch Seabiscuit's owners, Charles and Marcella Howard, and his trainer, Tom Smith, cheer on their horse in the race of his career against the great champion, War Admiral. So you're right, man. Here we go. With his screenplay for Seabiscuit, Gary Ross, nominated twice before for the Academy Award, ascends to a new realm of excellence and achievement with his trademark wit, his keen observation, and his intimate knowledge of the pathways of the human heart. It is no accident that it took a screenplay by Gary Ross to land a director like Gary Ross. Indeed, the screenplay is so breathtaking in its originality and in every way such a landmark accomplishment of the screenwriting art that one might well ask whether the, any award can sufficiently honor it when in fact it is the screenplay that bestows the honor upon the award. To any list that includes Wilder, Mankiewicz, and Sturgis must now be added a new name, Gary Ross. Dear Paul and Callie, thanks so much for doing this. Please read it verbatim and try to sound like you mean it. <laughs> I've really worked hard to tone it down. I know you guys think I'm some kind of blowhard or egomaniac. Or worse, one of those guys who alternates between delusions of grandeur and extreme self-loathing. I'm not. Basically, I'm a humble guy who still lives in the valley. In fact, I'm virtually Christ-like in my humility. <laughs> Between you and me, if it weren't for Laura Hillenbrand's book, I'd still be writing those things where a guy gets conked on the head and wakes up as somebody else. <laughs> I mean, between Laura and John Schwartzman, the truth is, I didn't have a whole lot to do besides make sure there was enough foam on my cappuccino. But the world doesn't need to know that. And please, guys, this is not a roast. This is a big, important night for me, even if I do have to share the award with a guy who can't hold my jock. At least it's not like the year Jane Campion won for the piano. Was that even written in English? And all I got was a tote bag full of hair gel and a sense of pen. Thanks again, you guys. You're the wind beneath my wings. Your friend, Gary.
Congratulations, Gary. <laughs> Thank you, Ward. Thank you. Um, that was absolutely fantastic. You know, I asked them to do this because I secretly have always wanted a Friars Club roast. And, you know, I got the Scripter Award. I thought I would just flip it around and, you know, hopefully they would roast me, which they adequately did. First, uh, I just want to say that it's awfully nice to be here. It's very nice to be here in the Doheny Library. I was actually a uh, former library commissioner for the city of Los Angeles, and Doheny is one of my favorite streets in Beverly Hills. So it's... <laughs> It's particularly moving for me. See, you're not the only one who can get a laugh. I just want you to know. Yeah, it's nice to be here. Um, it's also nice to share this award with a film that's so wonderful as Mystic River. I don't know if you guys know this, but it was a little like the runoff in Florida, actually. Um, uh, first, they had a bunch of nominations. There were five of us, all wonderful films, all equally deserving of this as us, Cold Mountain, uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, Mystic River, us. Oh, God, I'm leaving somebody out. Um, somebody help me. A master and Commander, excuse me, yeah. And then Brian and I tied. And we thought, oh, great, you know, they're just going to give us both an award. That'll be wonderful. But instead, they decided to have a runoff. So then they sent out new ballots, and they had another election, and I sent Warren Christopher down to make sure there were no hanging chads, you know. <laughs> it was a whole, whole fracas, but then we tied again. So, you know, uh, wonderfully. We, we both are sharing this award. By the way, Alan, this is the Mystic River Award, which you forgot to take for Brian, so you may want to come up. Here. He's, he's my lawyer, too, or he was until he accepted the award for the other writer. If anybody has Tom Hansen's phone number, I'd really like it. Um, it's, uh, it's especially nice to receive this kind of an award from uh, my friends Paul. I, 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 was, I wrote this before you roasted me, but I'll say it anyway. It's especially nice to receive this award from my friends Paul and Callie. Uh, and it's wonderful to be here with so many other writers. Uh, Naomi Foner, John Singleton, Faye Kanan, Howard Rodman, colleagues of mine who I, I respect so much. Uh, it's a great night for all of us who are writers because, well, we get to go outside and, and see people and eat food in public. and get a little fresh air, uh, you know, and when you do what we do all day, that's, that's really wonderful, which is why this event is so long, because, you know, who wants to go home? This is fantastic. We're not, we're not stuck in our office, and we, we all love award ceremonies. We get to dress up, and tomorrow morning, you know, we're just going to put on our sweatpants and decide not to take a shower and sit at our desk until blood comes out of our forehead. So tonight, it's fantastic, and and we all love awards, so just keep drinking. Um, I actually suppose, you know, writers do complain a lot about, about what they do, and that's understandable. It's, it's a very, very hard job, and it's, it's lonely, and there's ultimately no one to help you do it, despite the fact that everyone thinks they can. Um, so I suppose the question becomes, why do we do it? And I think that's because at its best, we love it. Um, even these guys, curmudgeonly as they try to pretend they are. Um, because when you've got a little momentum and you string a few good days together and you put your feet up and you read the pages back and you like them a little bit, uh, there's nothing better in the world. And uh, I'm just incredibly lucky and grateful that this is my job. I've been doing it now for 20 years and I honestly appreciate it more than I ever have. Uh, it means a lot for me to have all of you recognize my part in this process that began with Laura's book and continues through the film. Uh, and that's a process that was rewarding for me from start to finish. So I thank you all very, very much. Um, this is really a wonderful award because it honors both of us. It honors the entire process, as I said. Most specifically, it honors Laura Hillenbrand, who is the story, and I owe her so much. Seabiscuit was a celebrated piece of American history before Laura ever found it, as all of you know. But it really took her vision to understand it. Writing is all about taking the familiar and making it individual or unique, which I suppose is the same way as saying it's like taking something individual or unique and trying to make it universal. Um, Laura saw it through her own prism, and she realized that it was really a story about struggle and that overword redemption and healing. And she saw that it was about people, not a horse, and she realized that this story of an animal was really, in fact, a story about humanity. 
Well, as everyone knows, and as Richard has explained, Laura suffers from chronic fatigue syndrome, and it's a very debilitating disease for her. She has terrible vertigo. She can only sit up for a couple of hours at a time. Uh, but it was only after this whole process is over that I realized what a personal work this was for her. And I just want to read you one short paragraph from Seabiscuit. Not, not the screenplay, the, the book. Um, I hope I can read it, it's very small. Uh, man is preoccupied with freedom, yet he is laden with hardships, with handicaps. The breadth of his activity and experience is narrowed by the limitations of his relatively weak, sluggish body. The racehorse, by virtue of his awesome physical gifts, frees the jockey from himself. When a horse and jockey fly over the track together, there are moments in which the man's mind weds to the animal's body to form something greater than the sum of both parts. The horse partakes of the jockey's cunning, the jockey partakes of the horse's supreme power. For the jockey, for the jockey, the saddle is a piece of unparalleled exhilaration of transcendence. It's really, really beautiful. Uh, I, uh, I had never written, and it's obviously also very, very personal to Laura, and I had never written an adaptation before. I'd only written original screenplays, and I think by example, Laura pointed me toward the challenge that all adaptation is ultimately about, to stay faithful to the story, but to find something personal within it, to find something that you care about, something that moves you, something that can serve as your compass. And I was lucky enough to find a story that had so many things that sustained me through such a long, long process. This is ultimately a movie about healing and kindness, and you don't get to make those very often in Hollywood. So I'm very, very lucky, and I really appreciate what Laura Hillenbrand has done for me. Um, of course, the storytelling process doesn't stop with the screenplay, and I just want to thank a couple of people right now. Our producers, Frank Marshall and Kathy Kennedy. Um, my wife, Allison Thomas, also a producer. Another producer, Robin Bissell over here. Robin and Allison heard every page, every word as it came out of the typewriter, and I thank them for all of their help in the screenwriting process. Uh, Mary Parent, who's here tonight, and everyone else at Universal who are unbelievably supportive, <coughs> excuse me, to me through this process. My DP, John Schwartzman, my, that's director of photography, for those of you who are in academia. My DP, John Schwartzman, uh, who was such an amazing partner and a storyteller in his own right and made the visual realization of this movie a joy every single day. Thank you, John. And my editor, Billy Goldenberg, who of course has the final rewrite on the entire process, but he couldn't be here tonight because he's nominated for an editing award and he's across town with sweaty palms right now, wondering if he's gonna win. So uh, finally, I wanna thank an amazing cast. Gary, who's here, Elizabeth, who's here, Toby McGuire, Jeff Bridges, Chris Cooper. I was fortunate enough to work with some of the greatest actors in Hollywood and they made me look good. Uh, and they were smart enough to put my words away and make the part their own on many, many occasions, uh, which is what any great actor has to do, so I thank them also. Uh, I really, really appreciate this award. I've never adapted anything before, and to be rewarded by you all in this way is uh, tremendously, tremendously rewarding. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary, and congratulations to you. And Callie Corey, <laughs> I apologize to you for mispronouncing your name. Please forgive me. Whenever someone calls me Sharon Glass, I know exactly how you feel. So I'm so sorry. <laughs> now we come to the musical celebration of tonight's event, provided by Jason Goldman and the USC Thornton Jazz Orchestra. Jason Goldman is one of the best young jazz composers and band leaders around. He serves on the faculty of the Thornton School's Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz. Tonight, he will lead the Thornton School Orchestra in his arrangement of the theme songs from both of our winning films.
Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jason, and the Thornton Jazz Orchestra. Sorry, I was very taken away by that. Um, I want again to thank our presenters, Leonard Malton, Elaine Kagan, Richard Reeves, Anne Archer, John Singleton, Paul Antanasio, Elizabeth Banks, Gary Stevens, and Callie Corey. <laughs> and our winners, Dennis Lehane, Brian Helgeland, Laura Hillenbrand, and Gary Ross for our unforgettable evening. The night is still young, so for those of you who can't bring yourselves to leave, the bar in the tent will continue to serve. Good night. <laughs>